Okay, guys, let's do a quick step, though, a quick testing before we begin here. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Can you hear me through the webinar? Testing, testing, one, two, three. We're all good? Okay, perfect. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our eLotus webinar today, and I hope you guys are all staying warm. It's so cold here in California. Our Defin our California definition of cold. Um, for those of you where it's snowing, um, I don't know what to say because I, 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 I can't relate to you, but you're the real champ <laughs> for sure. So here at Lotus Institute of Integrative Medicine, we are the leading acupuncture CU provider offering the largest selection of CU courses for acupuncturists. So what that means for you is that you get to pick and choose courses that you find useful and you can apply in your practice right away. And today's class is one of those. So every month, Dr. Chen, he will be doing an herbal an herbal webinar, a one hour class, and it's free for you to attend. So this today's class was actually supposed to be in January, but due to unforeseen circumstances, it was moved. So we have two this week, so you're in luck. We have one today, which is Tuesday, and another one on Thursday in a couple of days. So we hope that you can join us for that time. So if you are, if you want to brush up on your herbal skills or have a refresher or learn something new, then this would be definitely be the class to attend. And once again, it is free for you guys. And so what you are seeing on your screen on the top left-hand corner is video feed. To the right of the video feed, you'll find the PowerPoint, PowerPoint for today's class. And there are lecture note handouts available for download. You'll also see a chat room here as well as, um, so in the chat room you can chat with your colleagues who are also attending today's webinar live. Okay, so today's class is Intro to Chinese Herbal Medicine, an overview with Dr. John Chen, who is a recognized authority in both Western pharmacology and Chinese medicine. He's the lead author of Chinese Medical Herbology and Pharmacology and Chinese Herbal Formulas and Applications. Both books are currently on the California State Board as well as NCC AOM as required text. Dr. Chen is currently a medical consultant with Evergreen Herbs, and we, uh, it is such an honor to have him join us today. So we'll go ahead and start the class. All right, so just a couple of minutes, I guess the weather, the crazy weather is affecting our technology just a little bit, so we'll just hang on tight for Dr. Chen to come back. All right, uh, my name is John Chen, and um, over the last few years, um, I have gotten a lot of requests from practitioners to teach her classes more often. And um, the requests came, I think, from two main groups of practitioners. One is acupuncturists who were educated and started practice quite some time ago, maybe in the 70s, 80s, and so on. So what happened is way back then, uh, the education focused a lot more on acupuncture and not as much on Chinese herbs, okay? And as a result, um, they don't feel as confident in the herbs as they would like to be. And I also got a lot of requests from medical doctors, pharmacists, and so on, uh, who are also drawn to Chinese medicine. And obviously, acupuncture is not too hard to get started but they tend to become, they tend to have a harder time with Chinese herbs, okay? So they always ask me um, where they can go to get more information, to learn more. And of course, I point them to the acupuncture schools, but the first thing they, they usually tell me is that um, they are very busy in their career and they can't take the time to enroll in school uh, for one, two, or three years to learn about herbs. 
So what I thought of is to teach a course of Chinese herbal medicine, uh, no, not so much into the details like they do in school, but at least as a starter. Okay, and what I mean by that is um, as an introduction, as a start beginner's course uh, in a way to help the practitioners uh, become more familiar with Chinese herbs. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use this opportunity not just to do an intro of Chinese herbal medicine as a whole, but also go into each and every chapter as well. Okay, so in today's class and over the next uh, 12 classes uh, or so, what we're going to do is we're going to explore maybe one or two chapters per one hour and basically go into uh, what is, let's say for example, chapter one, what is exterior releasing herb, okay? So we'll talk about what exterior, what the chapter is, what the herbs are, what are the effects, what are the side effects, uh, what is the herbology from a TCM perspective, and also what is, a, what is the pharmacology from a Western medicine perspective. So hopefully uh, with this series of 12 classes, the TCM practitioner can use this as a review to relearn the herbs and also to learn the pharmacology of the herbs. And then Western medicine practitioner uh, can use this as an intro uh, into the Chinese herbal medicine. So with that in mind, um, then you can then you know, further your study and go into each chapter, uh, whether you are reading the textbooks, whether you are listening to different CU classes, Hopefully after the intro, uh, everything will make a lot more sense. All right, so today is in a way the intro of the intros. Uh, so what I'll do is go over the fundamentals of Chinese herbal medicine. So for those of you uh, who are not very familiar, uh, for those of you who are restarting this after some time, uh, this I think will be a good place to start. And basically how, what I will be doing for the first hour and also for every hour after that, is look at some of the main topics associated with Chinese herbal medicine. And these main topics are all the bullets that you see over here. Okay, so uh, on the left-hand side, you have taste, temperature, channels or meridians, functions and indications of the herb, dosage, dosage form, and then the traditional pao zi, or the pr preparation and processing. All right, so these are uh, topics that are important to make sure you get the most out of the herb. So basically how to achieve the maximum efficacy. All right. So that's why we treat the patient. These are important topics to know. And then on the left side are the uh, cautions and contraindications. All right. So you have cautions, contraindications. Uh, what happens if you happen to overdose uh, the patient? And what can you do in terms of antidotes to treat the overdose si signs and symptoms? And then uh, herb herb interactions and herb drug interaction issues, as well as pregnancy, nursing, and also allergies. All right. So as opposed to the first part, which is to get the maximum efficacy, this part is to minimize the side effect and adverse reactions. All right. And that is just as important. So if you think of this kind of like driving, right? You need to make sure you have a gas and you have a brake. Okay, gas is what makes you go, brakes is what saves you and stops you, right? When we are treating the patient, it's, it's just the same thing. It's just, and just as important to know when to treat as it is to know when to not treat or when to be careful treating, all right? So hopefully by emphasizing in both areas, I will provide you with a balanced view uh, of herbal medicine because there are a lot of people especially over the counter that tend to overemphasize that herbs are all natural or substance are, supplements are all natural. Therefore, they are safe, have no side effects and, and whatsoever. But that's definitely not true, right? So there are some herbs that are perfectly safe, or generally speaking, very safe. There are some that certainly have some side effects. And then lastly, there are uh, a few that if, you, if not used properly, um, can definitely create more side effect than therapeutic effect. All right, so once again, throughout all my classes, I will be emphasizing uh, both sides. All right, so uh, one of the first thing that we have to understand is um, Chinese herbal medicine is as much of an art as it is a science. All right, so what happened is it's an art that's developed in a way through empirical observation 
then trial and error, and then clinical studies over about 2,000 years or so. Okay, and a lot of terms that I use to describe the herbs are somewhat artistic or philosophical or general common understanding. You know, so um, keep that in mind uh, as we go through some of the terminologies. All right, so one of the first terms that I generally use to describe the herb is the thermal properties of the herb. All right, so as you read different texts, th the text will describe herb as a hot herb or warm herb or cool or cold herb. All right, so that's describing the thermal properties of the herb. And what does that really mean? What does that really say? Well, what happened is uh, it's kind of like the yin and yang theory, right? So herbs that are warm or hot generally have the following type of properties. They are generally more young in nature. They are generally more stimulant or stimulatory in nature. They tend to be more associated with turning the body on, okay, or getting it to work uh, in an elevated, uh, in enhanced fashion, right? Uh, so if somebody has uh, fear and fright, okay, if somebody is under stress, right, is fighting something, generally um, that, uh, that those are all associated with the young aspect of the body and the young aspect of the herbs, okay? And to the opposite to that, of that is herbs that are cool or herbs that are cold, okay? So these are herbs that are most associated with the in nature of the body, okay? They tend to have more of an inhibitory type of effect. They are generally more associated with patients or persons that are resting and relaxing, okay? Or the body is off, okay? Um, another way to put this is that herbs that are warm and hot tend to be more stimulating toward the sympathetic nervous system, all right? So sympathetic nervous system, once again, is the, the organ system of the body that is associated with fight and fright, okay? During daytime, we need to work, we need to run, we need to do things. So warm and hot herbs tend to, more, tend to have a more stimulating effect on the sympathetic nervous system, okay? While the cold and cool herbs tend to have a more stimulating effect on the parasympathetic nervous system. So use of those herbs tend to stimulate the parasympathetic ne nervous system to help you with resting, relaxing, turning the body off, um, general concepts like that, okay? Another um, description from the physiology perspective is that herbs that are warm or hot, once again, tend to be more stimulating in nature. So in this case, they, a lot of them do have a stimulating effect on the endocrine system, all right? So they stimulate the hypothalamus, they stimulate the endocrine and pituitary, and that in turn stimulate all the glands to produce whatever necessary hormone so the body can do what it needs to do, all right? So once again, the warm and hot herbs, especially the tonic herb, tend to stimulate the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the endocrine system, okay? While the herbs that are cold or cool tend to send a negative feedback inhibition uh, signal to the endocrine system. So basically to stop the production and release of the hormones. All right, so once again, this is a very general concept. Okay, warm herb tend to be stimulating for the body. Cold and cool herb tend to be more inhibiting for the body. Okay, so if you keep that in mind, as you read about different herbs, um, they tend to have that generalization. Okay, another something that's generally used to describe herb is the five taste, all right? So herbs are described to be either taste or pungent. They are basically very similar or equivalent to each other's. They are described as sweet, sour or stringent, and then bitter or salty. Okay, so once again, uh, as you read the TCM Material Medica, these are the five tastes that are generally assigned to the herbs. So what happens is sometimes the herb have these tastes directly. Other times the herb have certain function, and therefore based on the function, certain tastes are assigned to the herb. Okay, because some, most of these tastes do have specific function and also indication. All right, so for example, 
herbs that are generally described as acrid or pungent, okay, usually have a very dispersing or moving properties. All right, so these are the herbs that generally have effect to release the exterior, have effect to induce perspiration, to move the qi, to help to improve digestive system, and also to you know promote blood circulation. All right. So some example of herb is like ma huang, herbal ephedra, which release the exterior. Or chen pi, pericarpium citri, uh, which is a qi moving herb, especially to help with the digestive system. And also chuan xiong, rhizoma chuan xiong, specifically to move the blood. All right. Another thing all these are having in common is that a lot of them all have a large amount of volatile oils. All right, so volatile oils tend to be very fragrant, tend to be very dispersing in nature. All right, so the herb and their content and their uh, taste do correlate well with each other. All right, so once again, if you uh, did not know, okay, if you just smell the herb, if you just taste the herb, and they feel very aromatic, chances are these are acrid and pungent herbs that have dispersing and moving properties. All right, the next one is herbs that have a sweet taste or maybe blend taste, okay? And what happened is these are herbs that generally are made out of a lot of carbohydrates, sugar, protein, amino acids, vitamins, and so on, all right? So what happened is these type of comp composition make up the building blocks for the body to have a normal physical uh, anatomy and also physiological function. So basically these are the herbs, the sweet herbs are the herbs that help the body to help itself. They are the ones that tonify the body, they help the body to build normal structure and help the body to carry out the normal functions. So most of the herbs that are tonic herbs that tonify qi, blood, yin and yang are herbs that have a sweet taste. All right, and two of the more commonly used herbs are zensen, which is ginseng, and huangqin, huangqi astragalus are two of the best er examples as far as qi tonic herbs that also have sweet taste. Okay, so once again, sweet taste help to tonify the body in both structure and form, so it's able to perform its normal functions. All right, next taste is sour or astringent. Okay, sour and astringent herb contain a lot of tannins and also organic acids. All right, so what happened is uh, they have a function to help to stabilize and bind, okay, or to reduce and prevent the loss of body fluids. Okay, and generally they are described as herbs that have astringent effect, anti-diarrheal effect, and hemostatic effect. So basically to help and prevent the loss of lung qi, when the patient coughs a lot, water when they have diarrhea for a long period of time, okay, or they lose a lot of blood because of bleeding. All right, so sour and astringent nerve tend to have a function to prevent the loss of qi and also the loss of body fluids. Okay, and two examples are herzi chibula and also wu beizi gala chinensis. Okay, so these are two examples of sour and astringent herbs. All right, and the last of the five taste is the bitter taste. All right, bitter taste tend to be the herbs that are very strong in nature. So whatever the function is, they tend to be quite strong. A lot of the bitter herbs contain a large amount of alkaloids and also glycosides, and also in turn have the strong strongest therapeutic effects. All right, so these bitter herbs generally tend to drain to clear, to purge, to eliminate, or to dry up dampness. All right, so they have very strong function, whatever their function may be. Pharmacologically, a lot of them have antibiotic effect, and that includes both antibacterial and antiviral. A lot of them have very strong anti-inflammatory effect, purgative effect, antipyretic effect, and so on. Okay, and a lot of, some examples of bitter taste herbs includes Da Huang, which is rhubarb, Huang Lian, Coptus, and Zimu, and the Marina. And these are just some of the many examples. All right, so when um, patients generally complain about the taste of herbs, that the herb tastes very bitter and it's, it's not very palatable. 
generally speaking, is these herbs that are bitter, that are very strong and have very, you know, uh, powerful functions. Okay. Okay. So once again, those are the five tastes. Okay. And the generalization is if an herb has certain taste, then you have certain sets of general functions like I just described for the last five tastes. Oh, one more. I'm sorry. The last one is salty. Okay. Salty herbs tend to have a lot of minerals and inorganic salts, uh, such as sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and so on. And their primary, primary function is to purge the excess, to soften the hardness, and also to help the herbs enter the kidney or the kidney channels. Okay. Examples include mang xiao, which is a mineral herb that's best for treating constipation. Okay. And basically what it does is it draws the water from the body, to the intestines to hydrate the intestines and help to osmo improve the osmosis and subsequently relieve constipation. And then you also have Hai Zhao, Sargassum, and Kun Bu, Dallas Ecolonia, and these are the kelp and seaweed type of, type of herbs. And they help to once again soften the hardness, specifically the enlargement of the thyroid gland uh, because they contain a lot of iodine. And then by giving the body more iodine, it helps the body to make a sufficient amount of thyroid hormone and therefore help to overcome uh, thyroid enlargement. All right. So those are the taste of the herbs. All right. Another commonly used term to describe the herb is the channel affiliation. Okay. So some of the books translate this as channel. Some translate as meridians. So basically these are the channels or meridians associated with the zhang fu organs or the internal organs. So you have heart, small intestine, spleen, stomach, lung, large intestine, kidney UB, and also liver GB. All right, so when an herb is described to go to the lung, channel or meridian, that means it helps to treat the lung itself, the organ itself, and also the affiliated channel and meridian and also the functions. Okay, so once again, this is not just the Western anatomical organ but also all the functions that are associated with it. All right, so for example, uh, Ban Xia Panelia is one of the commonly used Chinese herb, and one of the main indication is to treat nausea and vomiting. Okay, and because nausea and vomiting are associated with the stomach, Ban Xia is described to enter the stomach channel. Okay, another example is an herb called Shi Duan, Radix Dipsacus. Okay, Shi Duan has been shown to be a great herb to treat both soft tissue and skeletal disorder, uh, mainly trauma disorders. All right, so if the patient has broken bone, bone fracture, tears to the tendons and ligaments and muscles and so on, Shi Duan is one of the best herbs to use. Okay, and because soft tissues are controlled by the liver and bones controlled by the kidney, okay, then Shi Duan is described to en enter the liver and kidney channels. Okay, and the last example is an herb called Lu Xian Cao Pyrola. Okay, and this herb is described to enter the kidney channels. And what happened is kidney and ear are in Chinese medicine described as the inner and outer organs. Okay, and what they have found is that this herb, as part of entering the kidney channel affiliated with the ear, has also been shown to prevent the autotoxicity and nephrotoxicity associated with the aminoglycoside antibiotics. So these are some of the most powerful antibiotic drugs and their side effect is they damage the kidney and they also damage the ear. Okay, so this is somewhat of an integration of Chinese medicine and Western medicine in that Western medicine observes that this is a drug and those are the side effects, ear damage and kidney damage. And then you have one Chinese herb that enters the kidney organ and is able to help to protect the inner and outer organ at the same time. All right, so those are the taste, property, and channels that are uh, assigned to every single herb, okay? And then obviously, as we look at herb individually, uh, these are generally how the herbs are classified. They are classified into 20 chapters, okay? And each chapter has a specific uh, function and indication uh, for the herbs. Okay, so starting next week, what we're gonna do is go through one or two chapter at a time, 
And as we go through the functions and indications and all the characteristics of the herb, we will talk about all the effects and all the side effects. So once again, you get a balanced view of how or when to use the herb and also how and when not to use the herb. Okay, overall, um, 20 chapter may seem like a lot, okay, but basically it's not that difficult to learn, it's not that complicated. And the way is, if you just think of it as two main things, and that two main thing is we as human beings uh, live between heaven and earth, okay? And there are two main ways in which we get sick, okay? One is disease that come externally, and the other is d disease that's generated, generated internally, right? So the disease that come from exterior, from a TCM perspective, is wind, cold, heat, damp, dryness, summer damp, summer heat, that kind of things, right? So once again, it's somewhat of a philosophical description of the disease, but as we go through every chapter, I will then describe what do these terms really do, or what do these terms really mean, more or less from a biomedical perspective? You know, do they mean viral disorder, bacterial disorder, do they mean whatever, it, you know, whatever the, the condition may be? All right, so in addition to the TCM description, you know, we will go through more of the biomedical perspective of all these terms. And then internally, what happens is if you have imbalance of the internal organs, okay, whether it's from diet, whether it's from lifestyle, whether it's from whatever the cause is, you end up with imbalance of the internal organs. So yin and yang becomes out of ba balance. Then that can also cause disease. All right, so the bottom line is, all the disease come from either exterior or interior. And all the herb in these 20 chapters basically are to help either to eliminate the exterior pathogens or to balance the interior imbalance. Okay, so in the end, this is really what we try to do. Either eliminate the pathogenic factors or balance the interior and then help the body to heal itself. Okay, so if you can think of it from that perspective, then it's really not all that complicated. All right, so as we learn about the herbs, um, as we learn about how to put them together from single herbs into herbal formulas, uh, there are a lot of specific terminologies that I use on how to couple these herbs together. All right, so basically you can use herb for a singular effect and you use one herb at a time. And that's actually very rare. Uh, you have maybe one or two examples in which herbs are used singularly. In most cases, herbs are coupled together um, to maximize the effect and also to minimize the side effect. So the Chinese terminology could be mutual accentuation, enhancement, suppression, antagonism, and so on. All right, so the Chinese description, there are seven specific conditions of herbal combinations. But to simplify it, uh, if you just simply think of it as either synergistic effect or antagonistic effect, I think in most cases that will be sufficient. All right, so synergistic generally implies that the use of two herbs will give you much better therapeutic effect, perhaps at a lower dose and with less side effect. All right, so for example, Sigao gypsum and Zimu and Marina are generally combined together for much better effect to clear heat, more specifically to treat fever, all right? So when we get to chapter two, heat clearing herbs, I'll go into more detail as how they achieve that synergy, okay? The other example is antagonism, and this generally describes that when two herbs are combined together, how they can possibly cancel the effect of each other's or perhaps cancel the side effect of each other's. So for example, Zensen is a tonic herb, and Lai Fu Zi, Semen Rafanus, uh, which is a radish seed, is an herb that cancels the Qi tonic effect of Zensen. All right, so it's an antagonism because the first herb's effect is canceled out by the second herb, right? So when you are writing an herbal formula to tonify Qi, you do not want to combine these two herbs together. But if you ever come across a situation where the patient is overdosed on zensen, then what happens is Lai Fu Zi is actually one of the best antidotes as it cancels the to Qi tonic effect of zensen, then treat the overdose of zensen. 
All right, so keep in mind that synergy and antagonism are not good or bad. They are just reactions that happen. All right, so it's up to us to understand what happened and then use it to our advantage to better treat the patient. Okay, dosing is also important. Um, generally in the Materia Medica, the dosage that is listed is the standard or generic adult dose for an Asian population. Okay, so generally speaking, I think I'm physically quite average. I'm about 5'6 and about uh, 150 pounds or so. Uh, so what happened is when you see this adult uh, dose, so that's for somebody like me between the age of 18 to 60. Okay, if you ever treat patient that's not in this average adult category, then make sure to adjust the dose. Okay, so if the patient is younger, you generally need to adjust dosage downwards. Okay, if the patient is older, uh, geriatric patient, you also want to adjust the dosage a bit, little bit lower. So this gives you some general guideline uh, how much to adjust. Okay. And then at the same time, uh, if you're treating patient of different body weight, okay, you also need to make adjustment as well. Uh, patients that are young patients, pediatric patients, or ones that are very skinny, skinny, okay, you need to uh, bring down the dose a bit. Okay? And then similarly, most of the Caucasians are uh, taller and bigger. right? So if you have somebody that's 200, 300 pounds, then what happens is the standard generic dose for Asian males, uh, Asian patients, it's not going to be enough. You know, for somebody that's 300 pounds, you may want to increase the dose, maybe by 50%, maybe by 100% or more. Okay, so do keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, we also get asked quite a bit, or I get asked quite a bit, uh, what dose do you need to treat the animals? Okay. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, you can go to the Evergreen website, and there's going to be a tab and a chart on what dose you need to use to adjust from human dose to cats, dogs, horses, and so on. Um, in addition to those, um, dosage form is also important. Okay, historically, obviously we learned that decoction is the most commonly used form. Okay, um, and that is still true today, especially in Asian countries. Uh, but what happened is, a lot of patients today, uh, especially in Europe, United States, um, countries that in which the patient did not grow up taking decoctions, that might be a bit challenging. Right? And usually what happens is uh, if they have acute condition, they maybe they will go through the trouble and cook decoction for maybe a week or two, maybe a month at most. But if it's to treat a long-term condition, you know, let's say the patient has diabetes or hypothyroid or hypertension, where uh, you need to take the herb for several months or maybe years at a time, um, chances are you're not going to get very good compliance rate asking the patient to take decoction for months or years at a time. All right, so it is important to know what other dosage forms are there um, that works the best for the particular patients. All right, so powder uh, historically is used, uh, but historically what happened is when powder is used is simply raw herb ground into powder and then given directly to the patient. Okay, so if you do that, that's fine. But today, usually, um, there is a dosage form that's a lot more popular, and that's described as powder extract or granular extract. And what it is is herb that is cooked, just like they are in decoction. And once all the active ingredients are extracted, the water is then evaporated, and the extract is then turned into a solid dosage form or powder form. All right. So that is actually very convenient because you still have the water extraction, so the effect will mimic the decoction. And at the same time, uh, if you need to modify the formula, let's say you need to custom write the formula for the patient with powder dosage form, you still have the flexibility to modify, to add, to customize the formula for the patient. All right, so generally speaking, in many of the Asian countries, whether it's Taiwan or Japan, um, powder extract, Granular extract is generally considered to be the preferred dosage form. All right, and then what happens is for people that don't like the taste of herbs, okay, so they rather they still want to take the herb, but they don't w like the taste. Then the option is um, tablets or capsules. All right, so basically the powders or extract powders can be pressed into tablet or encapsulated 
That way they can take the herb, get the effect, um, but uh, they don't have to taste the herb. Um, the slight disadvantage is that capsules usually take about 15 minutes to 30 minutes to be fully dissolved, for the outer capsule to be dissolved, and for the absorption to begin. Okay, so there's a slight delay in absorption. Tablet may take even longer than that. Tablets may take somewhere between half an hour to one hour longer to dis disintegrate and dissolve. All right, so if you're treating somebody with a very acute condition, maybe acute migraine headache, okay, then tablet is perhaps not the best dosage form because of the delayed onset, okay. Um, tincture is generally not used in TCM in the past, not very much, uh, except for some, ex you know, examples. And most of the time, it's, gonna, it's the, the tonic herbs, all right, because a lot of tonic herbs are not very water-soluble. So what happens is when that is the case, generally herbs are either stir-fried stir fry with some liquor first and then water extracted, or some of the tonic herbs are soaked in uh, grain-based liquor, so the alcohol can extract out certain ingredients, and then the patient may take it as herbal wine. Okay, so you can use tincture or alcohol for some of the herb, but it's not used across the board. Okay, and then lastly, if the patient has an external disease, um, generally speaking, the herbs can be, can, can be made into a topical preparation. Either cream or ointment or plaster or anything along that line will be fine. Okay, and also I would say along with dosage form, also be creative with route of administration. And what I mean by that is, the idea of treating the patient is you want to get the medicine to the disease area as quickly and as effectively as you can, all right? And so if you are treating somebody with sore throat, right, then probably the easiest way is to give the herb in a solution and have them gargle with it so the herb can help to relieve the sore throat right away, okay? Rather than taking it as a tablet where they have to take it, the tablet goes to the stomach, it has to disintegrate, it has to dissolve, it has to be absorbed in the intestines. And once you absorb it, it then has to co pass through the liver before it goes to the blood and finally circu circulate back to the throat to relieve sore throat, right? So the idea is wherever the disease area is, think about what kind of dosage form you can use and how can you give the herbs to the patient in order to maximize the effect, all right? So you don't necessarily have to be so rigid and say decoction is old-fashioned, is the best, and I will not use any other form. Okay, be creative, uh, be open-minded, all right? And then generally speaking, uh, as the patient take herb, there are two main things that they want to avoid. Uh, number one is to avoid foods that are cold, raw, greasy, rotten, spoiled, or difficult to digest because the, they will put more pressure on the digestive system and you'll not get as much from the herbs, okay? And the other is for patients that are taking herbs, uh, make sure they don't drink tea at the exact same time, or they don't take the herb along with the tea, basically for swallowing, all right? And tea specifically refer to black tea, oolong tea, green tea, and poor tea. And the reason is because tea have a strong binding effect. So if you take tea along with herb at the same time, then tea will bind to part of the active ingredient in the herb, and flush them out of the system, and therefore, you end up with lower absorption and lower therapeutic effect. Okay, so ideally, you take the herb with warm water and not with tea. All right, some other consideration, there are some herbs that should be taken before meals, like tonic herbs, yeah, and there are some herbs, like the bitter and cold herbs, that should be taken after meals, okay? And also, the bitter and cold herb tend to irritate the stomach a little bit more, so if you take it with food or after meals, the food will help to cold the stomach and minimize that side effect, okay? Uh, from a Western perspective, okay, generally when they consider whether to take it with food or without food, what happens is if you take it, take it without food, basically on an empty stomach, then what happens is you start to absorb the medicine faster, right? So if you take it on empty stomach, then it will work, absor it will be absorbed faster you will be w it'll work better initially, especially if you are treating something acute, okay? And if you take it with meals, then what happens is the herb will mix with the food 
and the absorption will be lengthened out over a longer period of time. Okay, so you won't have that initial peak and strong effect and then followed by a quick drop. If you take it with food, then it's a slow and steady absorption over many hours. Okay, and then for Chinese herbs, the antiparasitic herbs and purgative herbs should be taken on an empty stomach. And herbs that calm the shen to help with sleeping should be taken at bedtime. Okay, so usually about half an hour to one hour before bedtime. And then today in the U.S., uh, if you have herbs that calm the shen, that tends to cause sedation or drowsiness, then you may, need, may want to warn the patient if that happens, then don't drive, okay, wait until uh, the effect passes before they go out and drive, because obviously you don't want them to get into car accidents. Okay, one other thing that's very important for the Chinese herb, and this is very unique to Chinese herb, is the traditional pao zi, which is the preparation and processing of the herbs. And once again, there are many different techniques to process the herbs, and there are many different reasons why herbs need to be processed. But the bottom line is uh, herbs are processed in order to maximize the effect and to minimize the side effects. All right, so those are the two main things, to maximize the effect and minimize the side effect. And then you have many bullet points that go into more specific details. All right, so as we go through different chapters of herb and different specific herbs, I will then give you more specific details. Okay, here is one, okay, Fu Zi, Aconite. Uh, Fu Zi is one of the most important herbs in the Chinese Materia Medica. It's also one of the strongest, it's also one of the hottest, okay? And when you see the herb, it's called Radix Aconiti Lateralis Purpurata. So Radix is the root, Aconiti is the aconite, and Lateralis is the lateral, or the daughter root, and obviously Purpurata is uh, the prepared root, all right? So this herb, when it's raw and, unpro and unprocessed, un unprocessed, is actually very, very hot, it's very strong, and it's probably more of a poison than it is a medicine, all right? So processing is very, very important to turn this herb from a poison to a medicine so you can get the maximum medicinal effect and keeping the side effect to a very minimum. And the side effect mainly come from the aconitum alkaloids, okay? So these are alkaloids, like I mentioned earlier, that are responsible for most of the, of the potent effects. Okay, and once again, the effect can potentially be side effect. And once again, these are the signs and symptoms or the toxicities. Okay, so I won't read you all this, you can see it yourself. But basically, uh, they cause a lot of toxicity to the cardiovascular system and also to the musculoskeletal system. Okay, it's very hot, it's very stimulating. So a lot of the muscles, like your tongue, your mouth, your lips, your throat, can become numb, okay, uh, initial, with initial contact. And if the herbs are absorbed, uh, the herb once, this herb, once again, can cause so much stimulation that it borders on uh, paralysis. And that affects the skeletal muscles to the limbs and also the, to the cardiac muscle of the heart. Okay, so preparation is very, very important. And if you prepare it properly, you can reduce the aconitum alkaloids, which are the toxic compounds, by up to 90 to 96%. Okay, so at that point, most of the poisonous compounds are gone, and then you have the therapeutic compounds. And preparation is rather lengthy and very um, detailed, all right? So what I have here is the classic description of how the herb is prepared, okay, many different ways, many different specific forms, okay. Um, generally speaking, this is already all done, even if you use a raw herb, okay, and the reason is because, once again, raw herb is considered a poison even in China, right, so um, generally speaking, uh, you need to have a special license or you need to be a pharmaceutical company really to be able to have or have an inventory the raw and processed aconite. All right, so pharmacies usually don't carry it, doctors usually don't have it, and if you do buy it, whether it's raw herb or prepared herbs or pills, generally speaking, they're already all processed. Okay, and once it's processed, uh, the aconitum alkaloid should be no more than 0.01%. 
All right. So this is what a lab test may look like, right? So this is the HPLC or TLC that look at the herbs. Um, and in this case, okay, the aconitum alkaloid content is 0.02%. Okay. In case if you end up with patients, um, not so much because the herb is not processed, but because perhaps it's overdose, okay. Uh, then what happened is these are the classic descriptions of how foods overdose may be treated. Okay, so this would be the herbal antidote. Okay, um, generic antidote and also specific antidote based on the signs and symptoms. All right, so knock on wood. I hope these are information that you never need to use. Okay. Another example of herb and preparation is Yen Hu Suo Herba or Rhizoma corydalis. Historically, this is described as an herb that activates qi and blood circulation. Okay, and today we know this is one of the best herbs to relieve pain. Okay, and two of the main active ingredients are corydalin and tetrahydropalmitine. And what happened is these are two alkaloids that are not very water soluble. Okay, so what happened is if you use the herb as is and you use it in a uh, water-based extract, then what happened is it's going to move the qi and blood, that's fine, but it's not going to extract the alkaloids that treat pain very well. So what they have found in the past is that by stir-frying yen hu suo with vinegar first, okay, it helps to turn and change the alkaloids into acetate, which is then water-soluble. Okay, so if you process it with vinegar first and then extract it with water, you will extract so much more of the active ingredients and the effect to treat pain will be far more s superior. All right, so if you're using this herb for analgesic purpose, this is the preparation method. You want to do it this way so you can get the most out of the herbs. Okay, another thing that's very important with this herb is that yen hu suo is usually harvested during the cold and rainy season, okay? And what happened historically when an herb is harvested, they usually um, take the active ingredient or the active part of the plant, which is the root in this case, and they dry it under the sun. But if you harvest it during the cold and rainy season, then what happened is the herb becomes moist and can easily be infested or in affected by the growth of fungus and mold. And by that time, what happens the fungus and mold will produce a byproduct called aflatoxins and aflatoxin is one of the strongest potent hepatotoxin and also carcinogen all right so at that point the, these roots are basically garbage and they really should be thrown away but unfortunately sometimes they are not thrown away or sometimes only when the farmers see it they will only throw away a certain portion that has fungus and mold but they don't throw away the rest but what happens is the rest of the earth can also be affected Anyways, my point is um, uh, one of the harvesting problem is the fungus and mold. And if it's not harvested and stored properly, you can have a yin hu suo that have aflatoxin, which if taken can cause liver toxicity and liver damage. All right. So once again, uh, this is something that has to be watched very carefully to make sure the root is tested so it does not contain high levels of aflatoxin. Okay. Generally, that means 20 ppb in the United States. Okay, that's the FDA requirement. And then in Europe, uh, the requirement is four for the total aflatoxin and two for the B1. Okay, so Europe treats herb as pharmaceuticals. Uh, so their requirements are generally more stringent than what it is in the United States. Okay, so once again, if you look at the lab test, you will see in this case, this is a German lab. Okay, that aflatoxin B1, B2, G1 and G2 is ND, which is non-detected. Okay, so that's the ideal scenario. Okay, then this is an NSF lab in the United States. So once again, Yen Hu Suo is tested, so it's ND or non-detected. Okay, so that will be the ideal scenario. And if it's not ND, then at least it should be below the threshold, whichever country you're from. All right, so in this case, the aflatoxin B1 is right at 2 ppb. Okay, so that's the maximum amount for Europe. All right. 
Beyond that, um, pregnancy and nursing are also something that we encounter quite a bit today. Okay, so those are patient populations that tend to be more fragile, that tend to have, you need to exercise, you know, special caution, all right? So these are a list of herbs that need to be used with caution during pregnancy, okay? And the next one is a list of herbs that are contraindicated during pregnancy and nursing. And I think if you are practicing today, um, let's say in the United States, I would say more or less you need to consider caution and contraindication both as contraindication. And the reason I say that is because of legal liability, uh, not so much just medical, okay? Uh, where, you know, obviously U.S. is a country with a lot of litigation issues, all right? So if something does happen and you treated a patient during pregnancy, uh, then what happened is um, it's going to be very hard for you to prove that the herbs that you use are herbs with caution that it is not the reason why something happened during pregnancy, okay? So generally speaking, I would stay away from both sets of herbs if the patient is pregnant, okay? But at the same time, historically, uh, there are also some herbs that have been used specifically to treat pregnancy-related complications, all right? Whether it's bleeding, whether it's restless fetus, whether it's whatever the issue may be. So there are some herbs, there are some formula to help to treat women during pregnancy. Okay, so these are some examples, all right? But overall, 99% um, of the other herbs are somewhere in between, all right? So they are not herbs that are caught to be used with caution or contraindication. They are not the herbs that have shown definite benefit, okay? So they are somewhere in between, meaning you need to use your professional judgment as to whether to use these herbs or not, whether they are more benefit than potential risk. Okay, so if you have far more benefit than risk, then by all means, consider using the herb. But if not, then it's probably better to use other ways or other met methods first. Maybe use diet, maybe use lifestyle, maybe use acupuncture, okay? So exhaust all the other options first before considering to use herbs, all right? Then once the baby is born, okay, then the unknown uh, variable becomes a lot less. So if you do feel like you need to use herb, basically the main consideration is that if you give the herbs to the mother and she's nursing, are you comfortable with those herbs passing down to the baby through breast milk? Okay, because you need to make that assumption. So let's say if the mother is very weak and deficient um, after carrying and after delivery, and you want to use the chi tonic herb and some blood tonic, okay? So if you make that, as th let's say if you decide to do that, then what's the worst case assumption? Well, the worst case is the chi tonics and the blood tonics may get to the baby, and the chi tonic and blood tonic are both warm, then what may happen is the baby may become more restless, may cry a little bit more, may have a hard time sleeping because of the warm nature of the herbs, okay? But generally speaking, that's about all you're gonna see as far as side effect goes, all right? So from that perspective, I think the risk is manageable and the benefit is much greater than the risk, okay? But vice versa, you know, let's say the mother has constipation and you decide to use herbs that are very strong uh, for their percolative function, such as da huang rhubarb then, well, then you might want to think twice because uh, if the herb happens to be too strong, then it may cause diarrhea, maybe electrolyte imbalance or dehydration. And that for a little baby can be quite serious. Okay, so those are things you want to consider before you decide whether to treat the patient or not. Okay, and one last thing is perhaps a compromise. Okay, and that is, let's say if you feel you need to treat the mother, Okay, because the mother is ill, maybe with infection, maybe with whatever the case may be, but the mother is also, you know, try to minimize the exposure to the baby as much as possible. Then what you can do is do the bump, pump and dump. Okay, so while you're treating the mother aggressively, have her pump out the breast milk and throw it away and feed the baby with breast, uh, baby formula at a time. And while you're treating the mother for that one week or so, uh, do it that way. And once the herbal treatment is over, then she can resume um, nursing the baby. So that's probably the best compromise. Okay, and if the mother has trouble with lactation, okay, these are some of the herbs 
that have been shown to help to treat the uh, obstruction associated with nursing, and that is the obstructive flow of the breast milk, where there's a lot of inflammation and pain. Okay, they will also help if the mother is not producing enough breast milk. Okay, but if they are not producing enough, that's usually a deficiency case. So in addition to using herb that help with lactation, you want to make sure the diet therapy is also incorporated because diet and nutritious food is actually what help the mother to produce more breast milk. Okay, diet-wise, uh, fresh fish or fresh pork feet, pig feet, cooked with papaya or with fresh peanuts is probably the best way. And basically what you want to do is pick one source of the protein and one source of the vegetable, put them together and cook it in water for a long time, basically to make it into a stew, and then have the mother drink the soup on a regular basis. And that will help greatly for the mother to produce more milk. All right. This list of herbs, by the way, is a very academic list. And the reason I say that is because uh, there are some herbs used here historically, but really are not allowed anymore. And one of them is Chuan San Jia, which is an anteater scale. And the last one is Zi He Che, which is a human placenta. Okay, so once again, those two herbs are not available, but the rest of the herbs are perfectly fine. All right. And then uh, at one point, uh, when they are done with nursing and they want to stop, these are some of the herbs that will help to inhibit or terminate lactation. All right, so you have Mang Xiao, Shen Xu, Man Ya, and Hua Jiao. Uh, all four are very useful. All right, so those are most of the you know, uh, things that we talked about so far are mostly therapeutic effect, right? So these are some of the issues you need to watch out for. Uh, the first one is herb-herb interactions, all right? So in Chinese medicine, these are generally divided into 18 incompatibles and 19 counteractions. So basically, these are the ones you want to avoid as far as putting the formula together. But generally speaking, most TCM practitioners know this already, and also most of the examples for these 18 and 19 uh, incompatibles are contain herbs that we don't really use a lot today. All right, so they are great for academic purpose. For clinical purpose, not so much, okay? Um, the other science that's very important is herb drug interactions. And this is something that's relatively new. So there is something that we do know, but there's probably a lot that we still don't know, okay? I'm not gonna elaborate in this topic here because this is something that I do as a completely separate topic, okay? Usually I teach it as a one day or two day course. One day is for beginners and two day is more advanced, okay? Where we go into both pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic interactions. So if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, please contact Lotus and uh, watch the webinar archives. Uh, there's gonna be both one day and two day courses for this topic. All right. Allergy is one of the more important topic today. Uh, a lot of patients today have a lot of different allergy issues. Okay, so this is something we need to be sensitive to. Um, generally speaking, they have a good idea what food that they are allergic to, but most of the time the patient or even the practitioner really have no idea who, if the patient has certain food allergy, then which one of the Chinese herbs they need to avoid. All right, so what you have here is on the left-hand side is the eight major uh, food groups that tend to cause allergy. And the ones on the right-hand side are the ones that I added in, okay, that you might want to be aware of. All right, so we have milk, egg, f fish, crustacean, peanuts, tree nuts, soybeans, wheat, then you have gluten, sulfide, and others. Okay, luckily for the very first five of the food groups, they are not an issue as far as Chinese herbs goes because there are really no Chinese herbs that is used that is a food or egg or fish. Basically, there's no allergy issue or no cross allergy issues, all right? So the ones we need to pay more attention to as far as major egg groups goes are the tree nuts, soybeans, and wheat, all right? So if the patient has allergy to tree nuts, okay, these are the two tree nuts you want to avoid because they tend to create more problems as far as uh, allergy goes. So the first one is bai guo, which is ginkgo nut. And the second one is li zhe, which is the lychee nut. Okay, 
but most of the practitioner will tell you that the ginkgo nut is more allergenic, but the lychee nut not so much. Okay, so what happened is if the patient has a mild skin allergy to tree nuts, but you need to use a lychee nut to treat a severe liver chi stagnation issue, let's say a gallstone, okay, then it's perhaps worth a try to start out lychee nut at a, at a low dosage. Okay, and the reason I say that is because there is low risk of cross allergy. Okay, so start out with a low dose, see how the patient responds, and if they have no problem, then gradually increase the dose so you can get to the therapeutic effect while keeping the risk manageable. All right, if the patient has allergy to soybeans, okay, these are some of the herbs you might want to watch out. Uh, the first one is Dan Dou Qi, it's exactly the soybeans, so you cannot use that. The next three are the gelatin type of Chinese herbs. Uh, you have A Jiao, which is a donkey hide. You have Gui Ban Jiao, which is a uh, turtle shell gelatin. And then the last one is Lu Jiao Jiao, which is a deer antler gelatin. All right? And usually what happens is during the manufacturing process of these three type of gelatins, little bit of soybean uh, oil is used to help to thicken the glue, okay? So if the patient is allergic to soybeans, uh, they could have cross allergy potential to the gelatin type of herbs, okay? The last one is He So Wu, which is polygonum, okay? Uh, he So Wu has two main ways to be processed. Historically, it is processed with black soybean, okay? So if that's the case, then you might want to avoid this herb if the patient has soybean allergy. Today, some of the supplier will simply steam the herb at high temperature and not use it with black soybean. So if that's the case, then there should be no problem. Okay, so uh, once again, uh, if the patient has soybean allergy and you need or want to use her soul, then make sure you ask the supplier and see how this her soul was originally processed. Okay, and then if the patient has wheat allergy, uh, these are the herbs you want to avoid. Ban Xia Qu. So this is the combination of Ban Xia and Shen Qu. Basically, Ban Xia Benalia is processed with Shen Qu. Then Fu Xiao Mai and Xiao Mai are wheat. Okay, so that's wheat a as is. Shen Qu is Masa Fermentada, also known as medicated leaven. Okay, so it's a blend of many herbs, and one of them is Xiao Mai. And then Yi Tang is malt. Okay, so they could be issued with wheat allergy as well. And if the patient is allergic to gluten, then basically the same thing. All the herbs that the patient had trouble with wheat, you should also avoid if the patient has allergy to gluten. Okay, and the last one is allergy to sulfite or sulfur di dioxide. Okay, and I should clarify the slide here in that these are not the herbs that have sulfite, but rather these are some of the herbs that are more likely to have been treated with sulfur dioxide, okay? And the reason is because sulfur dioxide is generally used as a preservative, basically to prevent spoilage and also to make the herb look um, white and more appealing, all right? So if the herb is a very expensive herb, if the herb is something that you need to preserve for a long period of time to not get spoiled, then some of the farmers in China may have used sulfur dioxide during the food processing stage, okay? And that's actually quite common in the U.S. W as well. A lot, su a lot, some of the foods are treated with sulfur dioxide, and one of the best examples is, in fact, grapes, all right? So in any case, um, these are the herbs that, as manufacturers, um, that they need to screen the herb against sulfide more closely. If you buy the herb, either as raw herb or as finished product, then these are the ones that are more likely to have been treated with sulfite. Okay, so as long as there's none that's used, or if it's below 10 parts per million, then that's generally considered to be safe. Uh, 10 parts per million is the FDA, FDA standard. Okay, the last part here is going to be the herbal toxicology, or toxicology as a whole. Okay, so once again, uh, the general uh, perception is that drugs are stronger, but at the same time, they have more toxicity. 
and that herbs are natural, therefore they are weaker, they are food supplements, but at the same time they are natural and safe and you know, will not have any toxic effect. That is true only to some extent, uh, but what you need to consider is that there are some drugs that could be very safe, and there are also a few herbs that potentially could be very toxic. All right, so don't fall for that generalization, especially since we are professional, we are experts. So you need to know more than that. Okay, and what I have here is two of the practitioners, one from Western medicine, one from Chinese medicine, who are considered to be the father of toxicology. One is Paracelsus, and he is famous for the adage that the difference between medicine and poison is the dose. Okay, so at some moderate dose, generally speaking, you have medicine. When you go above, then generally be, it becomes a poison. And this TCM practitioner's name is Liu Chun, and he is famous for the adage, Si Yao San Fen Du. And that means if it is medicine, then it has three parts poison. Okay, so meaning even if you use it within therapeutic effect, it is likely to have some side effect. It is possible to have some unintended consequence. Okay, so make sure you have the right diagnosis, right? Make sure you have the right formula. Make sure you have the right dose and dosage form. And even then, still follow up and monitor the patient. Make sure the herb and the medicine is doing what it's supposed to do. And if you notice any type of side effect or adverse reactions, then take steps to correct it before it's too late. All right. And generally what happens is, depending on the herb, depending on the drug, overdose and sign and symptom, sign and symptoms of overdose and adverse reactions may vary. Some will affect the digestive system, the respiratory system, central nervous system, and so on. All right. So different medicines, different drugs have different side effects. And here are some very quick examples. Uh, and these are three examples that have gotten the most notoriety uh, in the U.S. and Europe. The first one is ephedrine alkaloids. And these are the active compounds in ma huang ephedra. And these are both the active ingredients and also the ingredients that cause a side effect. Okay, so at the appropriate dose, ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, and ephedrine alkaloids, they go to the lung, they stimulate the lung, they dilate the lung. Therefore, they help to treat asthma. But at the same time, they go to the cardiovascular system, increase the heart rate, and increase the blood pressure. They also go to the central nervous system, cause stimulation to the brain, so the patient may have restlessness, insomnia, may have increased risk of seizure, and so on. All right. So on one hand, you have effect. On the other hand, you have side effect, and they really do go hand in hand. Okay. The next part is erythrolytic acid, and this is a issue that has gotten a lot of bad publicity. But the to the, the bottom line is, this is a compound that has been studied quite a bit, and at this point in time, is determined to be nephrotoxic. Okay, so all the herb in the U.S. that contain erythrocytic acid is basically banned. So the U.S. FDA has a zero tolerance uh, position. Okay, so none of these herbs are no longer available in the U.S. In Asian countries where they treat herb as a medicine, there is some allowance for effect and side effect. Then what happens is once that contains erythrocytic acid, if other substitutes are available, generally these substitutes are used. If not, uh, such as Si Xin Asarum, the last herb, then Si Xin is still allowed. It just needs to be used with extra caution. And the same with herbs that contain pyrolidazine alkaloid. Uh, these are herbs uh, these are compounds that are present in many different types of herbs and have also been shown that carry some risk to cause liver damage. All right. So these are herbs that also are banned in the United States because they contain pyrolidazine alkaloid. Uh, in Asia, they are still available, um, but they need to be used carefully and definitely not in patients who have pre-existing liver conditions. All right. And let's say if for some reason you use herbs and they suffer from side effects, okay? Generally speaking, the first thing you should do is to get rid of the offending agent as soon as possible. And that means you use emetic methods, purgative methods, or binding methods, all right? So emetic is to induce vomiting, so they can throw it up and throw it out. And then purgative and binding is to bind to it, to inactivate it, or to purge it out through stools. 
Okay, so once again, get rid of the toxins as much as p possible. But if it is av absorbed into the body, um, you have specific herbal antidotes. And when we get to it, then we'll talk about it. You also have acupuncture treatments uh, for general antidote issues. So these are the general points that you can use to treat whatever the overdose um, toxicities are. Okay, lastly, uh, quality control. Okay, I won't go into the detail except to say these are the main criteria you want to be aware of. And these are the main issues uh, that most of the herb companies watch out for, including heavy metals, microbials, mycotoxins, and herbicide and pesticides. So these are the four main things as far as quality control for the herbs that if you take care of it, uh, it cuts down a lot as far as adverse reactions associated with herbs goes. Okay, so overall, like we mentioned, uh, these are the main issues that we need to be aware of when we think of herbal medicine. You know, once again, we need to think about effect. We need to think about side effect. We need to think about when to treat and also when not to treat. So as we go through different chapters of herb and give you different examples of herbs, those are all the factors that we need to keep in mind, and those are all the factors that I will discuss. So you make sure you have a balanced view of herb and when to, or how to best use it to get the most out of it. All right, so that is my first introduction class for the herb. Okay, and once again, uh, if you are watching this on webinar, uh, feel free to send me emails uh, if you have any questions, and I'll be more than happy to reply back to you. All right, thank you very much, and I'll see you next time. Okay, thank you to Dr. Chen for a great class today, and thank you everyone for joining us. As Dr. Chen said, his next, this is the first of his series. The next one will be this Thursday, and we hope to see you guys there. And it'll be on exterior herbs. So we'll see you guys on Thursday. That's it for today. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.